Today we're going to be in Romans chapter 14. This is going to be the last sermon uh, in our series on Romans. Our fourth sermon is our last one, and after this we're going to go on to something else. So, we're going to be in Romans chapter 14. Now, in order to really understand the book of Romans, and especially the, the context of what exactly is happening in our passage today, we need to be able to understand the cultural context. You see, around this time, or several years before the book of Romans was written, um, for political issues, Jews were forced to leave the city of Rome. So all the Jews had to leave Rome um, for a certain amount of time. Well, it was about the time that the church was first beginning to spread, and uh, Christianity was first becoming accepted in all areas. It was about that time that Paul wrote the book of Romans, and it was about that time that Jews were permitted to come back into the city of Rome. So you have Jewish Christians who are moving into the city of Rome, and you have Gentile Christians who are already there, and they're having to come together in mesh into one church. Even though they're all Christians, they're all still very different people, and so that actually raises a few problems and a few issues. And this is possibly related to one of the issues that Paul is addressing today. Because whether it's this specific issue, the principle still applies that very different people will oftentimes have their problems. In Romans 14, <clears throat> verse 1, he says, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, believe it or not, one of the issues apparently going on in the Church of Rome was an issue over food. Now, we would laugh at that because if there is anything we would never disagree on, it's food. We know our food and we are happy with it. We don't understand why people would argue, but there's several reasons. Like I said, Jews and Gentiles coming together, there might be a little bit of a problem with food. Uh, maybe some Jewish Christians who are free in Christ, who are free from having to follow the same dietary laws that they once had to follow, perhaps maybe they still have some sort of conviction in their mind. They still think, well, I shouldn't eat pork. I still don't feel right about that. Whereas there are some Gentiles who are okay with it. Maybe it's an issue of food sacrificed to an idol, and this time food could be sacrificed to an idol, and the leftover food could just be taken and sold in the meat market, or could just be taken home and eaten with some guy and his friends. And some people had a problem with eating that food that had been sacrificed, and some people uh, didn't. And so you have controversies over what's allowed and what isn't. And these people are arguing with each other over it, and now keep in mind, though, Paul gives us this disclaimer. He says, the kind of controversies we're having, we are over disputable matters. There are things where you can't say, this is absolutely right, do it. This is absolutely wrong, do it. And Paul talks mostly about meat here, but it applies to a lot of other things that some people could see as wrong. Because the fact of the matter is, there are things that are perfectly, that are perfectly right, perfectly acceptable, that some people will still have a problem, will still have a personal conviction with. So the question is, where do we draw the line as far as considering someone else. Sure, we should consider our brothers and sisters, but at what point do I stop considering them and start practicing my own freedom in Christ? Well, that's what I want to talk about today, and I want to look today in Romans 14 at three absolute, undeniable, irrefutable truths that should help put this in perspective. They're very simple, very plain things, but they'll help us to get the right viewpoint on this issue. In Romans 14, verse 5, Paul writes, <clears throat> One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. So the first absolute irrefutable fact, we live for God. We live for God. Now Paul actually says here, we, li we live to God. I think it's just a way of him saying the way that we live, the way we conduct our lives, the actions we take, they're all done in ways that we should honor God. He says none of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. Well, I think basically what he means by that is that everything we do in life up to the point of death, and even including death, if the, if the case need, if it, if it calls for it, everything is done in a way that honors God. 
We live as followers of Christ and we die as followers of Christ. 1 Corinthians 8.6 says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things come and for whom we live. And I want you to understand something. It means something very special to say that we live for God. Living for God is a huge part of our lives. It's not something that we do on Sunday morning. Living for God is not something that we do while the kids are around or while the preacher is around or while the neighbors are over. Living for God is not something that we do in certain areas of our life, but we don't do it in other areas. It's something that consumes our entire existence. If we're not living for God, if living for God is not a consistent lifestyle that's seen in every aspect of our lives, it's not living for God. You know, one of the best analogies... I think for our relationship to God, and it's used oftentimes in the Bible as an analogy of marriage. Now, that's not to say you have to be married to understand your relationship with God, but simply enough, God looked and said, hey, you know, marriage is a lot like how you guys should relate to me. And he used several examples of it. For example, uh, the prophet Hosea. God told Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer. And Gomer kept cheating on him and kept leaving him and going to all these other men. And um, God had him do that because that illustrated, that marriage illustrated his relationship with Israel. Israel was constantly leaving God and constantly turning to idols from him. Uh, Jesus, in several of his parables, he compared heaven to being a wedding banquet. In the book of Revelation, the church itself is compared, is described as being the bride of Christ. It's just a good, steady analogy because, well, both relationships are based on one-to-one relationship. It's a marriage is a monogamous relationship. Um, our relationship to God is monotheistic. They're both based on love and commitment. They have the sim- similar principles. So it's a good analogy. So if I can follow that analogy a little bit, I want you guys to to visualize. I want you to really start using your imaginations here and and think about what would happen in this situation. Husbands, imagine this. Let's say you go to your wives one day and you say, you know what, honey, I love you, but I'm kind of spending a lot of time with you as it is. So how about this? I'll move into a different room of the house and we can just see each other about once a week. And then when the kids come over or when the preacher is around, then we'll still be together. We'll still, you know, act like we're having a good time. But quite frankly, you know, we just spend too much time together. So I'm content only being with you for a little while. Now, men, what would happen in that situation? If I can project a hypothesis, you would would walk away from that conversation, assuming you could still walk. You would really regret ever having it. Because our relationship with God, much like a relationship with a spouse, is not something that's just one area of our life. It's not something that's just done on a, uh, on, on a every now and then basis. It's something that's consistent, something that's constant. You see, to live a life that honors God means absolute, full commitment. This is in every area of our lives. We can't just give part of our lives over to God. And Paul says here that even when we eat, we eat to God. Eating is such a mundane thing. I mean, I eat probably several times a day and don't even realize that I'm eating. I don't even think about it. And yet, he says, even eating, we give thanks to God. Even the smallest, most mundane tasks in our lives, you know, we should have God in absolutely every aspect of what we do. The point is, God should infiltrate everything about us. So I want to ask you a very serious question, and I want you to think about it. Is there any part of your life that God is not involved in? Is there any part? Maybe it's in your family relationship. Maybe you don't pray with your family. You don't encourage your family to live closer to God. Maybe it's just in your free time. When you come home from work and you want to sit down and watch TV, there's a lot of trash on TV. Maybe sometimes you watch things that aren't really honoring to God. Maybe just when you do something, just for fun, you you fail to recognize that God has blessed you with the time and the ability to do it. God should be in every aspect of our lives. So is there any area of your life he's not in? Now, I really want you to think about that. Throughout the rest of this sermon, I want you to be thinking about that one question. Think about if there's an area in your life you could involve God more in. And actually, at the end of the sermon today, I want us to all pray together. I want to close in prayer. And I want us to all pray together, and I'm going to give us several seconds to take those things that we've thought about, those areas that we may not be involving God in. I want us to pray silently with God, just between me and God, just between you and God. I want us to pray about those before I finally close us in a in a joint prayer. So, absolute irrefutable fact number one is we live for God. Look at Romans 14, verse 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, 
As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in, Je as one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Now look at this next verse. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Absolute fact number two. If we live for God, it means we live for others as well. The fact is, Christ did not just die for me. Christ died for a lot of people. And if Christ died or cares enough for other people that he would die for them, and he is my Lord, don't you think that I should care about them as well? He says something here about destroying your brother. Now, he's speaking of actually damaging a person spiritually, leading them into sin in some way. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Now in the Corinthian church, apparently there was a similar situation and it dealt with food that had been sacrificed to idols. Paul says there's nothing wrong with that food, but if someone has some serious doubts about it, they're not convinced of it, and they they eat the food anyway, well, you may be leading them into sin if you've encouraged them to do that in some way. I think this happens more commonly than what we might think. We know we can be a stumbling block. We can cause people to sin. We know we can do that by sinning ourselves. When uh, teenagers at school are offered some type of drug and they give into it, well, those people who are offering it to them, they're dragging them down into their bad habits and into their sin. When someone encourages you to join into a conversation that's gossiping about someone else or speaking poorly of someone else, well, that's damaging you spiritually as well as them. They're pulling you down into their level. But it is possible to be a stumbling block to someone else without ever actually doing something that is wrong ourselves. You see, Paul says later that anything not done in faith is sin. And it is possible for something that is not wrong, that someone believes to be wrong, to become a stumbling block for them. I'll give you an example. I knew a minister one time, a friend of mine, who, um, who had a particular thing that he did, and he would do it in front of people, and it wasn't wrong. I don't think it was wrong. He didn't think it was wrong. But some people would have had a problem with it. And I remember him telling me that he, uh, he did this particular thing in front of some people, and people saw that and said, oh, well, it must be okay, and then they did it. And they did it when they wouldn't have done it otherwise, and it ended up becoming a problem for them. Even though he didn't do anything wrong, he actually damaged other people, and he was very serious. He understood how serious it was. He told me, Nathan, I am never... I am never going to do that in front of another person again, just for, just for the sake of other people. You see, to cause someone else to stumble is a very serious thing. Luke 17, 1, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for, than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. It's a very serious thing to lead someone else into sin. And he says something very, very meaningful here in our main text. He says, Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Now, obviously, eating is just one example. But I think he's drawing a very specific contrast here. He's saying, don't by eating destroy someone else. Eating is such a common thing. We do that several times a day. I do that a lot of times a day. Eating, we do it on a regular basis. We don't even think about it sometimes. And that's something so simple, yet if something so simple could cause someone to stumble, could harm them spiritually, shouldn't we care? Doesn't it make sense that we should put aside something, we should skip a meal if we have to, if it's going to mean the, the betterment of our brothers or sisters in Christ? It's certainly not worth harming someone over. It's such a small, mundane thing. And really, all things that could harm someone would be would fall into that same category. You see, the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Basically, what he's talking about is being willing to give up our freedoms for someone else. The fact is, Christ's death brought me freedom from sin, but it also brought us freedom 
from the law. Freedom from a, from a law that we have to follow exactly rigorously. And the fact is, that, that's something that Paul knows. That's something he understands. And he's been trying to get that across throughout the entire book of Romans. He's been saying, Christ died for you. You can practice your freedom. And now here in Romans 14, he makes a sudden turn and he stops and he says, no, Christ died for your brothers and sisters. So don't you dare do anything that could harm them. Basically, the expression of your freedom is not as important as the well-being as someone else. Have you guys ever wanted to ask God a question? I have about a million questions I would ask God. And I hope someday in heaven we'll be able to go right up to God and ask Him a question and He can tell us the answers. And that makes sense because I'm not God and I don't know everything and He is and so He does. We always want to ask God questions. It's natural for us to do that. Do you know what the first question mankind ever asked God? At least the first one that we actually have recorded in Scripture. In the book of Genesis, after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, they had children named Cain and Abel. Their son Cain killed his brother Abel. Now God came to Cain later on and said, Cain, where's your brother? And Cain posed that first question to God, that first question we are told mankind ever asked God, am I my brother's keeper? If I may paraphrase that, God said, Cain, Where's your brother? He said, I don't care. Why is it my problem? Am I really responsible for him? Should I be concerned about his well-being? And now here, 4,000 years later, in the book of Romans, Paul answers that question. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. You are responsible for other people. You see, we should never be able to say, I don't care. That's one of the most damaging things a Christian can ever say of someone else. We should care. Because we live for God and God died for others. So shouldn't we care for each other as well? Now sometimes caring for each other is going to mean that we give up our freedoms. Maybe there are certain things that we know are okay that other people would have problems with. Maybe we have to give those up. It's about considering other people. In everything we do, we need to think about others. Always ask this question. If someone saw me doing this, could it harm them spiritually? If we're not considerate of our brothers... Really, I'm going to venture to say we're not considerate of God. Essentially, what I'm saying is, you know what? I know Christ died for you. I know God loves you immensely, but I don't care about you. I love this meal more than I love you. At that point, we become a walking contradiction. Because if we live for God, we live for others. Simple rules. One more simple rule before we finish here. In Romans 14, verse 19, Paul says, Let us therefore... Make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. So, last truth. We live for God. We live for others. We live for the church. Now, this one probably makes the most sense. God established the church. I am part of the church. How I relate to you is part of the church. How me and you relate to others. We are all the church. Therefore, we should all be concerned about the well-being of this church, and we should all make it our goal to build the church up. The church is the work of Christ. And he says, if we cause our brothers to to stumble, we are destroying the work of Christ. Christ is trying to build this church of followers and faithful believers, and we're doing the exact opposite. We're tearing it down. He says here to make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Edification means to build up. That should be our goal. That should be what we're trying to do. You know, there's a wonderful example of this. Well, I shouldn't say it's a wonderful, it's a perfect example, but it's a very sad example in the history of our very churches and the restoration movement, which we are a part of. Uh, Not long after the Civil War, uh, a large, a big issue came up um, between different churches and the Restoration Movement, different congregations, the Restoration Movement. And people had different opinions, and they kind of argued back and forth about it. And this is one that we're all familiar with. It was actually uh, a question of whether or not it is right to use instruments in church. Now, both sides had errors. But if you ask me, I think probably our side, the instrumental side, was mostly in error. You see, 
Um, our brothers who do not use instruments, they said, you know what, we don't, we don't want to use, or we don't think we should use instruments, and we are not going to do that. And they started to leave. And our error is that we did not stop them. Basically, we held the practice of singing to God with musical accompaniment, we made that more important than what we made our fellowship with our fellow Christians. That's not to say we shouldn't be using instruments today. In fact, today there's actually a lot of work on both sides of that actually starting to come back together between the a cappella churches and the instrumental churches. They're actually starting to form back into a, into, into a more unified group now. That's something that's been going on for a few years. But the problem here is that when we looked back and we looked at our brothers and sisters who had a problem with what we were doing, essentially we said, I don't care. My freedom is more important than my unity with you. And that is where we were wrong. And that's something, that's, some, that's a sad effect that we're living with even today. How is it, if our goal should be to build up the church, how is it that we build up the church? First, we can't destroy the church. He says here, whatever you believe, keep it between yourself and God. It's about freedoms. If I believe something is right and someone thinks it isn't right, I should never say, I don't care. You can deal with it. You see, they are the church. By doing something like that, I'm harming my brothers and sisters. I'm harming the church overall. Now, he doesn't say you have to completely give up whatever it is that you're doing. What he says is it's between you and God. If you have strong faith on that, if you're convinced of that, it's between the two of you. Don't try to bring other people into it. But we should be doing more than just not destroying. We should be building as well. And one of the best building tools that Christians have is encouragement. Hebrews 3.13 says, Encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encouragement's a very powerful tool. So what ways can you encourage other people to live closer to God? Well, you can encourage them. There's a lot of easy ways. I'll give you a few ideas to get you started. You can encourage people by praying with them. You can encourage them by sharing with them. You can even encourage somebody by thanking them. Every single time somebody plays piano for church, or does a special music number, or closes in prayer, or something like that, I try to remember to thank them. Now, sometimes I forget, and I'm sorry if I've forgotten to thank you for something, but I try to remember to thank people for that. Not just because they're helping me, but because they're doing something for the church. And I want to encourage them to do that. I want to encourage them to keep working for the church. You see, we, could, we do what we can for each other because we live for this church that God has built. So, let's go back to that question that I asked at the very beginning. Where is it that we draw the line? Where do I draw the line between considering someone else and my own personal freedom? Well, I think probably the better question is why are we even concerned with the line? You see, it's not about what I have the freedom to do. Think about what my life should be lived for. I live for God. I live for others. I live for the church. After all of that, there may not be much time for me to live for myself. And that's okay. Because the fact is, my life is not about me. I think if we could sum up what Paul is saying here into one phrase, I think that would be a very good one. My life is not about me. It's about others. Well, before we close, like I said, I want to lead us in prayer. So those things that you were thinking about, I want to encourage you to, to think about those and to, to maybe take a few moments to pray with God silently, just between yourself and Him, about those things. Father, Lord, um, God, we come to you and we know that we are not perfect and we know that we don't always relate to each other perfectly. But God, I just pray that you will please give us the wisdom and the understanding to know how to treat each other well and how to really live for you and live for your people and to live for your church, Father. Please help us in this and help us just to make our goal and our purpose in life to honor you and help us to give over all areas of our life to you. In your name we pray. Amen.